hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, Leia Temper from the ICTA Autonomous University of Barcelona. And uh, I'll be presenting today uh, the Acknowledge Network. The acronym is uh, Activist Academic Co-Production of Knowledge for Environmental Justice. And we are one of the uh, three funded projects under the ISSC. Uh, so I would like to start the presentation uh, paying tribute. Does anybody know who this woman is? A few people in the audience. So uh, this is uh, Berta Caceres, and she was the uh, coordinator of the Civic Council of the Indigenous and Popular Organizations of Honduras. She's a woman, indigenous, environmentalist, activist, and uh, she was murdered in her home on uh, the 3rd of March of this, of this year. Uh, she won the Goldman Prize uh, last year, actually, specifically, I mean, for her struggles, a long history of struggle. She's been uh, fighting for uh, the territorial sovereignty and rights of the indigenous Lenca people in Honduras for the past 20 years. And she was uh, particularly well known for a struggle against the Agua Zarca Dam that was funded by the World Bank and uh, by Sino Hydro. And actually, they, they did manage uh, to have the World Bank and Sino Hydro pull out of that project. But uh, the project now has new investors and uh, is continuing. So uh, Berta's death uh, is very tragic. And uh, actually, since, since she died, uh, other activists, another activist, Nelson Garcia in Honduras, was also killed. But uh, it's, not, uh, it's not extraordinary. Uh, Global Witness has been tracking the deaths of environmental activists, and they're calculating that about two environmental activists are killed every week. And um, so, actually, this reminds me, I was speaking to an activist in, in Colombia, and she said to me, uh, you know, the government says, we can negotiate with the guerrillas, but we can never negotiate with the environmentalists. Uh, and this is partly because the environmentalists perhaps cannot be compromised, but it's also because the environmentalists represent perhaps the deepest threat to the entire uh, productive and extractivist economy that is being pushed today. So in many cases, they have become uh, enemy number one, we can say. Uh, the interesting thing about um, the reaction to Berta's death uh, in particular was that it has sparked a huge response internationally and a huge global outcry. And this uh, has come from all quarters. Uh, the dam itself is one, it has got a lot of attention, this one project, but it's part of a network. There's about 49 dams that are meant to be built on their territory, and uh, those dams are uh, very closely related to uh, several mining projects. Uh, those mining projects were put into place following a 2009 coup that deposed the democratic government, and uh, you know, a new they put an end to a nine-year moratorium on mining projects in Honduras, and uh, with the advent of new trade laws and uh, a new Canadian-backed mining law. I'm actually Canadian, so uh, there's a lot of uh, Canadian mining conflicts in in Latin America. So, because Berta was a woman, indigenous. Uh, environmentalist activist, uh, her death has sparked really a convergence of struggles. And we see how uh, different movements from all over the world are joining in the call for justice for Berta. 
And for me, it's particularly interesting to see all of these voices from Via Campesina, from movements that are working against hydropower, from movements that are working against dams, from movements that are working on climate justice, because a lot of those dams are funded by uh, carbon credits, partially. And in all these uh, resistances we see, in all these movements, we see, I think, we can see a, kind of the contours and the traces of what I would call a global movement for environmental justice that is emerging. And um, so the Acknowledge project is uh, dedicated to analyzing these global movements for environmental justice and specifically looking at the transformative alternatives that they're putting forth. Actually, the day that uh, Berto was killed, they were participating in a forum of, uh, on energy alternatives and environmental justice. So um, I'll speak a bit a bit mo about more of that, but uh, the, uh, the Acknowledge Network, you can see here some of the actors and the participants of the network. There's a platform from UK. It's uh, co-coordinated by Ashish Kotari from Kalpavriksh in India. Bogazici University is a part of it, uh, the Global Environmental Justice Group at the University of East Anglia, Grupo Conflu Confluencias, which is a network in Latin America working on uh, conflict transformation. And we have uh, the American University of Beirut, which is uh, a new institute uh, called the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship, and they're based in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. So uh, this project is actually building on a long experience and a previous project called EJOLT, the Environmental Justice Organization's Liabilities and Trade Project that was coordinated uh, from ICTA UAB by Joan Martinez Allier and included a consortium of 23 members, both activists and academic institutions. And one of the main outputs of the EJOL project was a global mapping of ecological conflicts. And until the present, we have uh, 1,700 cases, uh, conflicts of ecological conflicts that have been mapped in the database. Uh, each case has about a, a database form and we track about 100 different fields from who the actors and the conflicts are, who the investors are, what the forms of mobilization they're using are, what the commodities are, what sector is involved. So as you can see, well, it's a bit difficult to see perhaps, but you can see uh, some of the points. Uh, some, some regions are quite well mapped and we have uh, pretty comprehensive information and other ones, uh, we. As to the present, we don't have uh, information about. So you might see some empty spaces on the atlas. It doesn't mean that there's no ecological conflicts there. It just means that up to the present, we haven't had the opportunity to, uh, to map them. So the atlas until the present, it's been active uh, for two years. We had the uh, two year anniversary recently that it's been public. If you want to... Uh, see it online, it's ejatlas.org. And um, it's up until the present, it's had uh, half, half a million uh, viewers use the page. There's a really a wide uh, variety in the type of users. It's used for pedagogical purposes, uh, journalists, students, researchers and activists, as well as those from affected communities have all been using it based on a, a survey that we gave. And here you can see uh, a few of the press articles that have come out of the Atlas. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, particularly been very effective in places where the, the inventory is more complete and correct. In uh, Colombia, for example, I believe we have about 80 cases mapped and uh, the atlas came out at the same time during a, a drought in the, 
a terrible drought in Colombia. And you can see that uh, the Atlas made the front page of the newspaper there. And here you can see the journalists have taken the information and put it through their own analysis and created their own tables and graphs, trying to understand the shape of the ecological conflicts in Colombia. So, um, what is the shape of this global movement of environmental justice? And uh, the history of the environmental justice movement, I won't go into it uh, so much now, but it was born in the United States and very much based on the idea of the unequal distribution of pollution, uh, particularly among marginalized communities and very much along uh, racial and class lines. Um, but a more transformative perspective of environmental justice is not only asking for a more equal distribution of pollution, it's actually claiming for a complete transformation of the productive model. And they're putting forward alternatives and visions for their own ideas of what a good life is and what well-being is. So this is the main emphasis uh, that we hope to focus on on this new project is really focusing on the transformative visions that are coming out of these struggles. Uh, so here I'll just talk about uh, five of kind of the sub lines uh, within the project that we hope to engage in. The first is a comparative and statistical political ecology. <clears throat> the second is a increased and improved engagement with the Atlas. The third is a regional focus, and in particular, we're focusing on uh, environmental justice in the Middle East and North Africa. The fourth is a synthesis of alternatives and transformative visions that are coming from these conflicts and resistances. And the fifth one is a reflexive process on the co-production of knowledge within the project itself. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. Uh, so we now have uh, 1,700 uh, cases in the Atlas, and the goal is to expand the number of cases, and as I mentioned, fill in some of those blank spots that we have. And this provides uh, the opportunity for a comparative and uh, what we, even if we reach enough cases, we can say uh, st statistical political ecology in a way that has not been done before. So, f five minutes? Okay, I don't have much time, but I'll like, go through these. So, this uh, analysis helps us to understand kind of what are the underlying power relations as well as the socio-metabolic processes that are driving the conflicts but also to do analysis across regions, across thematic issues, and uh, temporarily across time. And uh, we plan to do this using different forms of quantitative, geospatial, and network analysis. And you can see here, uh, there's a, a network analysis that was conducted by a researcher, Cem Iskander Aydin, uh, as part of the previous project. And what it maps out is the mining companies that are involved in the conflicts uh, that we had at that point. I think it was 354 mining conflicts that we had mapped. I believe now we would have uh, closer to 500 mapped. And it under, it's understanding the interconnections between them. And of course, we could add to that the financial institutions that are investing in these mining projects and the network analysis would get much more complex. Similarly, he also did a network analysis of the environmental justice organizations and how they are networked amongst themselves and how they make alliances to fight on particular struggles. Uh, the second element is to improve the engagement with the Atlas as a tool for activism and learning. So uh, within the project, as well as the mapped conflicts, we also create featured maps. And those maps have been used for campaigns on specific issues. Uh, here's one that was done uh, on climate debt. It was a collaboration with a researcher and it includes his calculations as well as the conflicts. Uh, here's one with the Stop Corporate Impunity campaign. 
and it was uh, created for a tr the permanent tribunal of the people against uh, violations against human rights and access uh, to justice for indigenous peoples. And um, we've also had, uh, as kind of side outputs from the project, uh, several sub-platforms at the national and, uh, national and regional levels. So here is one that was made, uh, the entire atlas was translated to Italian, and this is an Italian sub-platform that was coordinated by uh, Ejolt uh, collaborators uh, CDCA from Italy and ASUD, and uh, they have documented 100 cases in Italy in a participatory process with local assemblies. There's also a similar process that's happened in Turkey and a similar process that's also taken place in Portugal and in the United States. So uh, these are essentially democratizing the information and making it accessible to the people in their own languages and also directly engaging with the activists that are fighting at the struggles, which is difficult to do at the global level. Uh, one of the major objectives of the project is also, we have uh, two partners, uh, Rania Masri, I don't know if she's here, uh, at the American University of Beirut, and Hamza Hamouchin from uh, the North African Environmental Justice Network and Platform London. And uh, the idea is to uh, create one of these sub-platforms for the Middle East and North Africa that would be in both French, uh, sorry, French and Arabic. And uh, it's quite, this, uh, this image you're seeing here is actually a book uh, that was written by Hamsa, the two collaborators of the project, Hamsa and Mika from Platform. And it's called uh, The Coming Revolution in North Africa, The Fight for Climate Justice. And, uh, you know, they were saying that when they tried to translate this book to Arabic, there was no term for climate justice in Arabic. And it was very difficult to get across the message. And similarly, they say that the term environmental justice doesn't actually make sense uh, in, the, in the North African context, that while there are a variety of ecological struggles, of course, uh, those on the ground are not defining themselves as environmentalists. They see themselves, of course, fighting for social rights, sometimes fighting for jobs or for labor rights. And uh, I mean, this brings up an interesting question that uh, we won't really come into here, but uh, is it an imposition, in a sense, to talk about environmental justice there, or does this create more of an opportunity to introduce these ideas? And how do we transmit? Uh, how do we transmit these ideas there? And uh, I was speaking to Hamza, and he said, "Well, the I mean, creating a, an atlas for the region would help to show those." involved in these mobilizations, that their conflicts and the issues that they're facing are connected to broader issues, and that there are similarities between the different countries, so they're not, uh, they're not fighting isolated battles. So these are some of the questions we're going to be engaging with further in the project. Uh, the fourth element of the project is about really tracking the alternatives and understanding what are, under what conditions do these mobilizations turn into forces for social transformations. Of course, being involved in struggle is always uh, leads to personal transformation, but when does it lead to larger transformations at the society? And... Uh, so one question is, what are the alternative narr narratives emerging from these struggles and how can they be synthesized? And uh, so, I mean, many of them we've talked about here. People talk about energy sovereignty. They talk about uh, degrowth, ecofeminisms, sumac kausai, buen vivir. Uh, this aspect of the project will be mostly led by uh, Ashish Kotari from the Kalpavriksh organization in India. And uh, this, I have to thank Sarah because we've been uh, 
documenting conflicts for so long and uh, people often say to us, oh, but what about the alternatives? How are you really bringing forward those visions? Why are you always focusing on the conflicts? And this project is really an opportunity to show that the conflicts, alternatives are born from resistance. Uh, the last element of the project, and perhaps the most important, is uh, a deeper analysis and reflexive process into doing this type of research. So this uh, mapping project is very much a, a hybrid research project. We're trying to fulfill many needs at once. So in one hand, we are trying, we do rigorous research and all the data is fact-checked and moderated and uh, it's quite systematic. On the other hand, we're trying to pr provide a platform that activists can use for advocacy and for networking. So, uh, ha you know, this leads to a very imperfect process in a sense. There's a lot of creativity and spontaneity, but you can't direct it in the same sense that you would a normal research project. And uh, I guess one of the main questions is, we call this atlas uh, the, the atlas of environmental justice. And a lot of people also say, well, it's actually, of course, the atlas of environmental injustice, because that's what you're showing, the injustices. And uh, we also have this, uh, we have a form in the at, we have a one question in the form that says, do you think that this conflict has, let, has been a success for environmental justice. And of course, this is also very, very problematic. Uh, there's lots of debates about how do you define a success? And the broader question is, what is environmental justice? We know what uh, an environmental injustice is, but what does environmental justice look like? So this will be one of the broader questions we'll be engaging with in the project. Thank you very much. I represent the Transgressive Learning and Transformative Climate Change Adaptation Project. Short is, the short name is T-Learning. We are a, a number of, of scholars and practitioners from South Africa, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, Vietnam, India, Sweden, the Netherlands, and, and maybe, and I know also from, from Latin America, one country. Um, so, in short, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to understand transgressive learning and, and do research in these countries. So we're basing our project on, on eight or eight to nine case studies, different case studies that, that are still comparable. Um, and we are connecting different uh, activities to this process, for example, a research school that goes across these, um, the whole uh, project. I'm going to try to uh, answer to uh, three questions that we got as a preparation for this um, panel. So the first one is to the question, what do I see as the biggest social transformation need or opportunity in relation to sustainability today or in the future? Um, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not an educational researcher um, by training. I, I'm an ethicist and a theologian and did my work on environmental ethics and ecofeminism, which I guess relates to, to your work a lot. But, but uh, I've been sort of um, drawn and pushed and into the field of, of, of education and educational sciences for the last year. So I, what I think is, is the greatest need is, is sort of a meta perspective, I guess. There's this huge need to raise awareness of understanding social transformation to sustainability as a transgressive learning process or as a learning process. And to do this in, in a context of insecurity and epistemological and ethical ambivalence, right? So, so we have this whole discourse of, of post-normality -normal and, and wicked problems which, which imposes that, that uh, uh, we are living our lives in, in, in a sort of a sea of, of epistemic and ontological and, and uh, ethical insecurity and ambivalence. Uh, so of course the, the, 
when when things get shaky for us, uh, we we sort of run to a safe haven or a safe ground and search for something stable. And I think that that we need to fight that that urge. We need to understand that that um, in order to to deal with these issues, we have to see these challenges and these processes as learning processes. And this this might seem trivial, but it's not. We often take learning for granted. We think that it's automatically a good thing, and or that it leads to something good. But, but of course, we know that that is not the case at all. Most of the cases, it's actually not. We are created this world. Um, we who are cre have created this world are are educative people, educated people. So, so there needs to be this issue needs to be addressed both in formal education and in social learning. That is learning processes out, outside of school. Learning processes that happens in, when banks are driven into a crisis or when, when, uh, when s small and, and medium enterprises are trying to, to cover an area of, of, of the market. We need to look at different um, stakeholders and players in this process. And we need to understand how the learning that, that is involved in these processes can be transgressive, that is, can fight um, uh, taking for granted um, power structures, uh, authorities, and so forth. So, so I, I think that, uh, I think that there's a super great need to establish practices around um, transgressive learning and integrated research on and with the potentially transgressive learning practices to these ends, uh, that is to understand how, how these processes work. Uh, this seems to be crucial to create, create enabling circumstances for this kind of informal and formal learning and to understand transformation. I guess I think that if we don't understand this from a learning perspective, we won't understand it at all. Or it will at least be inadequate. The second question was how, how we in our funded project or in our work generally are approaching this challenge and what more needs to be done by various actors to support this work, how it can help make a change. So what we are doing is that we approach this issue integrating education and social learning theory and methodology on a number of T-learning case studies in different countries and settings, studying and taking part in T-learning processes. Of course, this is, this is viewed as, as something uh, somewhat uh, iffy or, 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 or tacky sometimes uh, um, from the perspective of, of, um, of orthodox, uh, the orthodox research community. But we need to find ways of, of working together with, with stakeholders in these processes. And we need to find, as you said earlier, um, I don't know what, what you're going to call it, research-based or, or, or serious ways of, of working with this. All this kind of work, you know, sometimes they, people who fund us, they seem not, not I'm not talking about the ISSC now because <laughs> I think that they have a different approach. But from working in, in interdisciplinary higher education and research since, I guess, the, the late 90s, it seems as if they think that if you just push a lot of people from different perspectives in the same room, something, some, something magical will happen. Well, well, it doesn't actually. We need to, to understand these, these approaches. Um, if we understand them as learning pro uh, processes, then we can also understand what kind of enabling circumstances that we can create in order for for something um, creative to come out of it. Um, yeah, so, so it's no longer a matter of, of applied research. It's no longer a matter of, of uh, looking at research or education and learning as, a, 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 as an instrument for accomplishing something. It's a matter of, of working together towards uh, a joint end and also to understand that these processes create these ends and are created by them, right? So, so the issues at hand and the methodologies and the, the, the models that we use to try to resolve them 
are emerging in, in, in the very same process that we are involved in. And, and I guess that, that uh, learning research and, and theory can help us to, 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 to get a, our hands on, to get a grip on this, how this works. So, uh, what more needs to be done by various actors to support this work? How it can help make a change? Uh, well, I guess that research councils, other funding agencies, municipality leadership, business sector needs to work together towards building enabling circumstances for interaction. And it's sort of trivial to say this, but I guess everyone involved in this and in this room might say, yeah, we know this. And when I started to, when I fell in love with interdisciplinarity, when I started to study, my professor said, yeah, but we did that in the 60s, you know, it's not, we all know it's important. Uh, but, but, but it's serious business, it's developmental methodology, infrastructure, dynamic conceptual framework and theory. It seems trivial, but it's complicated and it's stuff, complicated stuff that, that needs careful work. And this is what we will also try to accomplish in, in, in our project. Uh, and the third question was, what value do, do we think could be brought by an inter- and transdisciplinary research network focusing on social transformations to sustainability? What activities, functions, features, products should it have? Who should be involved? Well, of course, there's a need for unorthodox activities, functions, features, etc to enable, develop, test, and scale new, not yet defined emerging activities. This kind of things should be promoted. I think we should have... Well, who are these guys who, who got the Nobel? Grafen, was that the Grafen? Yeah. You, know, you heard about those guys, right, who had this... Every Friday they had some, some kind of crazy Friday. Did you hear about that? No. So in the research group they just went ballistic on Fridays. That's when they came up with how they could make a frog float in the air and, and do stuff. And this thing that they got the Nobel, Nobel Prize of. We need to, to, to find ways of creating that kind of enabling uh, uh, circumstances. So I guess I think that what is needed is stable conceptual, methodological and analytical dynamic frameworks that, 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 that are enabling. And, and we need to... to there's a lot of other stuff as well. We need, they, they, they need to, to enable trust, um, what I used to call theoretical promiscuity. You know, that, that you, you need to... F that this, I mean, promiscuity isn't really uh, applauded by everyone, I know. There's an awesome book called The Ethical Slut, who, 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 who dwells on this issue, actually, how you can be responsible and, promiscu and promiscuous at the same time. And I think that we need to, to take the, the lust, the attraction, the, the fun part of promiscuity and take that into our works to find new and different and maybe strange partners to work with. Um, yeah. I don't know why I jumped into, jumped into that. It's a favorite, favorite topic, uh, I guess. Um, I guess that's it. I guess basically uh, we, we will try to understand these processes as, as learning processes and, and, and based on that try to, to move forward and look at how we can enable um, transgressive learning processes in a whole lot of different settings uh, for, for transformation. Thank you. Basically, I am um, uh, also trying to answer the, the questions that Sarah proposed us. You know, I did my homework, as always, which doesn't mean that I did a good job, but I did my homework. So first of all, well, we are talking about transformation to sustainability. And I believe that when we saw the call, and by we, I mean a collective, a consortium of eight universities and grassroots organization. We were a group of uh, eight, um, eight uh, institutional researchers and grassroots organization from Brazil, Turkey, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Sweden, uh, South Africa, and India. Well, we thought that it was a great, uh, kind of unique possibility. And so we, come up with the, we came up with this idea of merging just justice and more specifically environmental and social justice and sustainability. And so we decided to start 
some kind of common work on sustainability, making up the acronym, as always you must do when you apply for money, right? But we also were struggling with something. Uh, and uh, what we were struggling with was the uh, very category of sustainability. So to, to tell you the truth, and we are few of us, so I can be very open, right? And in the end, we didn't get the money, so what worse can happen to me, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, so the point is that, well, sustainability is basically an empty word. We can say that, I mean, who is against sustainability today? I believe that the people supporting atomic energy are pretty much uh, pro-sustainability, right? The eco-modernist manifesto is pro-sustainability. So, this is, I believe that this is the problem that we were facing. But what I would like to say is that for us, this, um, this problem was not so much a mistake, you know, we, it's not so much that we needed to find another word, but we needed to understand what was wrong with this category. And I believe that it was not a mistake, but rather it was a depoliticizing dispositive. So precisely the idea of sustainability might serve, and I would argue that has served many times, in order to foster the narrative for the rule of the experts. Right, so everybody is pro sustainability, right? And my wonder, I mean, generally, my question is always the same sustainable for whom? Or sustainable what? For instance, and I know that I may be a little bit cynical here, I would say that if the point is to have a sustainable capitalism, well, maybe I am pretty much, you know, for unsustainability, unsustainability. I would fight against sustainability. And this is not just a joke, but it's true that there is an idea that you know, the, the best we can do is to sustain capitalism. And you know, so we will have green capitalism, we will have green economy, and so on and so forth. So I believe that challenging the very idea of sustainability is very, uh, is very crucial. And this was actually our also uh, taken in the, in the proposal. Then another question was about what is the main challenge for sustainability, and let's use this word, right? So, of course, as I said, for us, the main challenge was justice, and, and in a way, talking now after uh, the other speakers, I am a little bit in trouble because somebody uh, taught me that you, you shouldn't plagiarize people, right? And so I am now just repeating, repeating about, you know, the things about environmental justice and, and so on and so forth. So, precisely, this was our idea, no? Basically, the big challenge is to merge sustainability and social and environmental justice. It's not enough to speak about sustainability. But on the other hand, I mean, maybe what I should say now is that the big challenge for sustainability today is capitalism per se. So is it possible to, to foster, to build a sustainable uh, society if we don't change completely our system, no? And I believe that this is something that uh, might be worth of uh, thinking and exploring. Another question that we were supposed to um, try to address tonight was the, uh, basically, if I understood correctly the question, what this network could actually bring and what we would like to see. Uh, from this network, so the network that Sarah has mentioned, you know, the transformation to sustainability network. Well, this is, I, I must say that this, this is a kind of uh, not easy question to answer. Why? Because we have so many networks. I, uh, just in this conference, there was another side event, sorry, <laughs> and the other side event was uh, about networking. So there is a, you know, the idea to build a network of political ecology. I, I cannot even remember in how many networks I, I belong, generally sleeping as always, right? Sometimes a, bit, a little bit active, but most of the time sleeping and I am not even a beauty. Uh, so <laughs> for sure I am not waiting for any charming prince, so don't, don't bother, right? I am happy uh, Prince sleeping. Justice. Huh? Prince Justice. Prince Justice could be interesting. <laughs> and not, no, maybe red rather than. <laughs> so anyway, what, what I think is that um, uh, we, are, we are all member of so many, members of so many networks. So what, what can we say new? 
Do we need another network? Well, there are several kinds of networks. There is a lobbying network, no? The one that can lobby in a good, sorry, in a good sense for us. So what I mean is that you, I believe that our network is actually helping to try to find, to find for instance, other agencies who might, which might be interested in funding other projects like mine, for instance. So I can just be happy about this. So lobbying network can be very useful. Then there, is, there are, uh, like I would say, service networks. So, you know, I am part of some networks in which I can find job position, call for papers, so sometimes, um, uh, well, basically, especially this kind of information. And then there is a more, I would say, like scientific network. So the one where you can find for instance, discussion about books. You can find maybe um, also, you know, discussion about themes, topics, uh, and um, those kind of ne networks many times are not very institutionalized. It can be just a mailing list, right? So we have different kind of networks, and maybe all of them are good for something, right? They, they have their own purpose. I believe that something that I would like to see from this network is to challenge the mainstream ideas about this neo, neo, late neoliberal academic system. So for instance, what does it mean to speak about, uh, you know, can, can we imagine a different way of uh, evaluating Grant's proposal? Because if a grant proposal is about, you know, changing the world, are we sure that we, and I am speaking especially about myself, we academics are the right people in charge to make this, uh, this decision? Could we do something different? Could we introduce a different kind of peer review, let's say, uh, of these things? I would really like to see something like that. Could we challenge the obsession with outputs? Could we challenge the idea that, you know, bibliometry is the only way in which we should be evaluated. And, you know, there is an inherent contradiction between, you know, cooperating and competing, which is, you know, it's, it's, it was, you know, at the core of this call. In a, in a way, we, we are cooperating, and I am very happy, actually, because many of my friends are part of uh, other mm, networks, right? Other consortium, let's say. But on the other side, we were also competing. And can we find a way in which it's possible to foster, uh, you know, great research but also collaboration and try to break this uh, obsession with competition, which maybe is not the only um, solution. Uh, finally, I can say something in the end. Before, uh, I will also ask for two minutes, so if I need to present my project, I will show a, a short clip, but in one second. The only thing that I want to say is that at a certain point, the International Social Science Council invited us, all of us, in, um, in South Africa and mm, to discuss our project and especially to discuss about the network. Actually, it was a great experience. I am very grateful for this. And they asked us to bring one object which can be representative of uh, transformation towards sustainability. So I had the discussion with the people in my network, and I had an idea. My idea was to bring there the balaclava and uh, to put the balaclava on my face and say that for me, this was my idea of transformation towards sustainability. It became invisible like the subcomandante Marcos. But the people in my network said, you know, Marco, it's a great idea, but in the end, we want the money. <laughs> So, you know, do whatever you wish, but, you know, we want the money. So, you know, next time I will bring my balaclava in the end. We didn't get the money, but it's, the balaclava is better. So if we can show a, 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 this short clip. There is a movie about the, our, um, our uh, project, and it can be it's that just two minutes, so it's very short. And it's a way maybe to, to show you what we would like to do eventually.
e será um lugar onde cada um de nós pode florescer, cumprindo todo o seu potencial humano e, ao mesmo tempo, viver bem em conjunto. Como agregar e concretizar sonhos comuns para a nossa cidade? Como comunicar e trabalhar em conjunto de forma construtiva e eficiente? No seu percurso económico, a primeira transição que nos assiste todos os dias pessoas, grupos e iniciativas com quem descobre para partilhar com os outros, desejos semelhantes, e o reconhecimento de que todos temos um papel a cumprir, um papel a cumprir para as mudanças que queremos ver acontecer. O curso introdutório de iniciativas de transição surge desta rota. Um ponto de encontro entre pessoas de diferentes formas de país. Thanks, Marco, and David, and, and Lea. Um, for a little bit more clarification, Marco did not get the money in the last uh, round. Marco was a seed grantee, but uh, we received so many excellent proposals in this last call for proposals that, of course, uh, many very, very promising and uh, very excellent proposals could not get funded. But there was a moment at which, before the final decision had been made, we brought a group of finalists together in Durban. Um, and I think what was special about that workshop was that we had a group of people together, some of whom were going to be funded, more of whom were not going to be funded, but who found uh, an enthusiasm and a will to work together and to stay working together even after the funding process was concluded. And so this is also why we are here today at Marco's invitation and with the support of the, the Swedish Secretariat for Environmental Earth System Sciences, who's supporting this particular session. Um, so I have to thank Marco very much for uh, hosting us here. He's certainly a, a part of this core network that we have established and which we hope will grow. I'd also like to thank Marco for the snow this morning because that was the first snow I had all year. Um, Can I say something? Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I think maybe we will take, if there are some questions, a couple of questions from the audience, either to our speakers who are doing the research towards the social transformations to sustainability, or if you have more general questions on the program, I'm also very happy to answer. I can't actually see anybody very well, but uh, if you have questions, jump up and down, and, and we'll see you. And that looks like a resounding silence, but <laughs> I think it's, oh, there's one in the back. There's a microphone on its way. Sorry, who's doing it? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Sarah from Portugal, and thank you very much for uh, your presentations. I have a question for David. When you were talking about the enabling spaces, um, they are um, spaces for researchers, uh, right? I, I didn't understand very well for whom they are uh, these di um, enabling spaces, and. Uh, Maybe you could first answer to this question, so then I can make the second one. Yeah, I think that, that uh, you have to answer that question in relation to the issue at hand that you're working with or on. So, uh, um, I guess my, my um, 
position is that that uh, we need to enable the the relevant and appropriate powers at at the right time, right? So sometimes it it needs to be researchers, but in case of the the this project, we are working closely together with practitioners. So so it needs to be. I guess what I was trying to say is that we need enabling spaces for research, for integrated research to, to develop and, and grow. And that kind of research involves uh, practitioners, scholars, um, I mean, rep people representing different uh, knowledge systems, indigenous knowledge systems, art, you name it. Okay. And I think it's, I, I guess I think it's hard to say that uh, it should be these people or those people. I think we need actually to, to, to let that answer emerge as we work with the, with the issues. Okay, it, it was just to clarify because it, it mm. wasn't very clear for me what, what okay. was the no, I was probably project unclear. to whom. So, uh, how, how, do you see, uh, how, how, how do you see that these enabling spaces can be created? Because sometimes even if we want very strongly to overcome some boundaries between mm. what it means to make a serious work as a researcher and as an academic and you know all the pleasure and joy that we can take from that uh, still is a very serious thing but mm. it seems um, not very frequent uh, to, to a, a scientist point of view to have that involved in the work that we do uh, so I just wanted you to comment a little bit. How do you see these uh, enabling spaces that could be? How do you imagine them? Thanks. Yeah, that's an awesome question. Someone? No. <laughs> no, I, I think it, it can be from, um, from my own experience uh, in, in, within academia, say. It's, I, I have been able to... Um, grow or maybe flourish uh, in an uh, interdisciplinary space because of um, cunning people in, in the organization with people with power who who has the um, they have so much credibility so they can do whatever they want right they have already been it was this guy in theoretical astrophysics professor ben Gustafsson at Uppsala university who was super engaged in interdisciplinarity and other st cross-cutting stuff. And, and he was behind um, creating a, an enabling space for a student-driven uh, um, center at Uppsala University, for example. And, and in that case, I guess it was because he, um, he knew how to work the system and then he trusted the students. I was a student at the time. He trusted the students to do higher education for themselves. Uh, so that is one way of, of doing it. I guess another way of doing it is, is what the ISSC is doing. Funding projects that are loose cannons in a, in, in a way, so they, so they can sort of run with it. Um, I don't know if that's a, that's a good answer. And of course it can be also done with a lot of different technologies and, and, and uh, sharing spaces today. Yeah. If I Thank could you. add uh, just a word to that as well, I think the seed grant phase of our program was intended to create these kinds of spaces as well. It gave uh, a grant of 30,000 euros to 38 groups in order that they can bring the relevant people together, whether it be for a two or three day workshop or a series of, of shorter visits and field trips, but essentially, people from different academic disciplines, domains of science, and sectors of society. And when it came to them, the second call for proposals, call for the main research projects, there was really a very clear difference between those projects which had emerged from the seed grant phase and those which had not, because the call was open again, um, in terms of the co-design. The co-design was so much more sophisticated in proposals which had come from the those seed grants. And I think there we see some evidence that a small amount of funding, in which case, uh, in this case, which came from CEDA, can do very, very much in terms of developing uh, a much more sophisticated proposal for research. 
I'll just uh, add some other examples here in the spirit of uh, speaking about different alternatives. Uh, so, in the past few months, uh, and this actually, I have to give uh, some kudos for the uh, International Social Science Council that, uh, you know, I am also a quite a precariat researcher in the sense that I don't have a permanent position at the university. So, uh, you know, in between uh, having the projects, I have been collaborating with other institutions. And I think uh, I do have to actually give them some acknowledgement for that because, you know, the, the idea of building the capacity of young researchers, I think, was actually uh, seen through in this case. But um, I have been collaborating the past months on a project which uh, it's kind of the other way around, is uh, bringing science to the field. Um, and it's about doing participatory plant breeding with farmers. So farmers, of course, they are, they are breeders. But uh, the question is, OK, how do we combine with them and kind of give them guidance so that they can do the science themselves? And there's a methodology of uh, uh, participatory uh, farmer, agri uh, they're called uh, ag participatory agricultural research committees, or CIALIS. And uh, it's quite common now. It started in Colombia and uh, growing now in uh, Honduras, actually, that we were speaking about before. And they have their own methodology. It's like an eight-step process. And the first step is motivation. And, um, you know, they go through kind of the joint analysis and the joint evaluation of the different uh, crops that they're breeding based on, based on their own specific niche needs. So this is, I think, a very... I mean, it's kind of the counterexample, is instead of how do we change things within the academy, and these projects are supported by academics, but they're going out there and working with the farmers, and they're, I mean, they're, these processes are creating amazing empowerment for the communities that are involved in them, because, you know, they never thought, oh, we're actually doing scientific work, and of course they are, and they, they have been. So that's, I think, another of these nice examples. So I've seen two more questions, uh, and I think we'll we'll stop it there. We'll take the two. T okay, three quick questions then, and then that will be it. Please go ahead. Uh, it was actually uh, just a provocative yeah. statement, following on what Professor Amiro said and what you just mentioned. Also, I mean, it's great to talk about changing. Uh, how do you say, not thinking about outputs all the time and not thinking about competition and how should we, uh, as you said, uh, judge a uh, grant proposal and such. But it's very hard to think about that in the system of universities that we have now because, as Leah said, most of us are precarious and uh, we have to deal with the... I mean, with research and with project management and administrative issues, and we have short-term contracts, and you don't know what's happening in six months, and you have to publish, and you have to do that and that, and you have to do interdisciplinary research, but at the same time be true to your theoretical framework. And then, I mean, it's a mess. So, I mean, when we are here and we are all happy and intellectually stimulated, we're like, oh my God, that's amazing what I'm doing. When I go back to my own university, I'm like, you know, I, I don't want to say a bad word, but, you know, you know I'm like... What am I going to do? And then, again, when I go to society and I, st and I try to explain what I'm doing, there is so much uh, segments of society, at least in Italy, I'm Italian and I now work in Venice, that don't understand the importance of research. So I still have to defend my position and my value as a researcher. So I think it's, you know, I don't want to bring too much cynicism, but it's amazing to talk about sustainability when our own positions are not sustainable. And, you know, I, I mean, we have to maybe think again about the way universities are moving towards and how commercialized and marketized they are becoming. And uh, labels, what you said was also very interesting, the fact that we have to re reinvent name projects the sexiest way ever. I think that's also a very dangerous path we're going uh, towards. Uh, so thank you. I don't know if this is a note of optimism, but um, so the, I'm Rebecca Oliver. I'm from Future Earth. Um, and I was... Um, uh, 
wondering, I, I thought the, the map of um, conflicts was absolutely amazing. Um, and I think that it's incredibly powerful at a time when new narratives are emerging. And I'm wondering if we're joining narratives the way it, we could. So I don't know how many people in this room have uh, noticed that the Swedish furniture company, IKEA, announced uh, a few months ago the peak stuff. I don't know if you are aware of that. So, um, you know, and they live off selling stuff. So peak stuff obviously means that they're looking um, at transformation um, within their production. Um, and where uh, peak stuff is one narrative and um, extracting, um, mining, uh, developing new energy sources is creating uh, so, uh, social injustice and conflict. That's another narrative. And those two narratives together become very powerful. And whether or not they uh, describe an alternative to capitalism or not, I, I don't think they do. I don't think we have a, an alternative to capitalism, but we do have different ways of performing. We're not practicing um, capitalism in, 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 in a way that necessarily is the only way. But I think that we should join narratives, and I don't know if we should join forces. I don't know whether, you know, th there's parts of IKEA's um, supply chain that you can work with. But I think narratives are emerging everywhere, um, and I think we should be joining them as much as we can, um, because we are in the beginning of a huge transformation, and we should study it, but we should also accelerate it. So I don't, I'd be interested to know what you think. Thanks, Rebecca. Could you pass to the row in front? Hello, my name is Claudia from Stockholm Resilience Center. So thank you for very interesting presentations. I think something that you brought up is this intrinsic link between the global and the local. And uh, my question is, there's, uh, to what extent have you addressed like all these very important findings to feed into discussions, for example, as information documents under the Convention of Biological Diversity or under the work of the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services in the interface between science and policy. So that's my question. Thank you. Thanks for those comments and questions. Would anyone on the panel like to make a remark? I can say something to the first uh, uh, question there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I agree. And, and um, I think that, that uh, one thing that we can actually do, although it's hard, is to demand accountability of, of senior scholars. Because uh, many of us are trapped in this, this um, chase for, for cash, basically, and, and you know, um, publications and that but but most people are pretty decent so so there might be ways there but that is connected to if we can look at, at I'm not a big fan of, of um, best practices and all that I think it, we need to ditch that for something else but but um, I think that if we can look at how stuff has worked in, in other places, then we might be able to identify positions and roles among uh, the academic staff that seems to be, to be uh, um, uh, like uh, generating uh, generative moments or, or moments of change or can enable stuff. And then look at our, our own organization and try to identify them uh, and, and maybe draw them together or find strategies to work with that. I, I guess it's... Or, or, or we have to leave and do something else. That's, that's also a possibility, of course. But that is not fun because we love academia and academic works. We don't want to do that, so we, yeah. Uh, hi, Rebecca, thanks. Uh, so I have not uh, seen, I have not heard anything about this IKEA peak stuff announcement, so I'm not, I'm not sure in uh, what context it was made. There's a, you know, people say, I think there's a book that was called uh, peak, peak Everything. But, uh, I mean, I would be, I would be very, 
I would be very uh, skeptical about about that approach. I don't know. Maybe IKEA is talking about peak stuff for you know the kind of its target audience in the commercial areas that it, it has its shops, because you know there's uh, <laughs> billions of people that are you know still not living at the same material level that uh, we are currently living in nowadays and they have never heard of IKEA. So, uh, you know, there's a tremendous potential for further expansion leading to further environmental pressures and further extractivism. I mean, just look at Asia alone, look at China, look at India. I mean, if you start to think about what this would mean if everyone there starts to uh, try to have the same material social metabolism that we have, you, you can begin to think of what the atlas would look like. You know, it would, uh, it would be, completely, be, be completely covered. Um, and the other, I mean, I would also, uh, in agreement with Marco, <laughs> very much uh, disagree that we can have a better capitalism that can address uh, the environmental crisis because of course we, we can have a better I mean we can have a better capitalism we can keep on tweaking it and make it slightly better and that's that's what we have been doing and that's the how we have been addressing things you know oh we can just tweak it here and we'll have this cop and we're only going to go up 2 degrees and so on and and so forth but the capitalist i mean the crisis of the capitalist system and this is this question of what are the alternatives narratives and vision it's a values crisis so it's not going to be i mean the it's a systemic crisis as well so it can't be solved by by slightly tweaking the system just the last point uh, about this idea of peak everything i mean um, you know this, uh, these extractivist projects are responding to the market. So as soon as the prices go up, you know, the technology is also developed to reach the oil that was before unreachable or to extract the gold that is, you know, in the, iron, in the ore in such a small degree that it creates a terrible overburden and, uh, you know, huge waste streams. And this is something interesting also about what we see in the atlas because there's all these victories uh, somebody was talking about uh, i think the first day i don't know if you were here she was talking oh this iron ore mine was not developed in sweden because of a because of a bankruptcy and in canada several gold mining projects and in latin america as well are being stopped and we can claim them as victories, but how much does it have to do with the mobilization, which is also raising the price of the commodities in a sense, and how much does it have to do with the commodities bust? So this whole question of when we're reaching peak, I mean, it always has to respond to the, to the bottom line. So I think we need to be careful to speak in this uh, kind of more, uh, you know, general terms. And uh, in response to your question, I mean, there has been a lot of uh, there has been a lot of requests and interests from different organisations to to draw on and to engage with uh, with the work that we have been documenting. So we have to see also how uh, I mean, as we move towards better documentation and more complete documentation, I think that it can become a more and more important tool also for policy questions. Okay, I will not kidnap you too long, so very shortly. W well, one question about the situation in our universities. In, uh, well, first of all, this is precisely, you know, the effect of, for instance, thousands or at least hundreds of different contracts, different uh, job positions. So, we, well, basically somebody like me would say, you, you know, we, we need to, be, to get organized. And this is what is also happening. If you think about the, ref the collective reflection about the, 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 the free job in the university, in the academia, the fact that you know, the big uh, publisher company, they are making money out of uh, free labor with the peer review. 
I mean, I am very happy to do peer review, but I am a little bit confused why I need to, to work for free and somebody's making money. I mean, I am ready to do, you know, 24 hour of peer review and then everything is common access. Otherwise, you know, I am a little bit, you know, perplexed. So get organized is one question. The other issue I would say, I know that it's a little bit paternalistic and I, I, I realize this, but I believe that sometimes we are the first sensor, is English, sensor of ourselves. So we need to be uh, also in a, in a way bold. I remember that when I applied for my first Marie Curie fellowship with John Martinez Salier, actually, uh, well, many colleagues told me, Marco, you are crazy, don't submit this grant, European Union will never give you the grant. Because in my grant, I said, you know, if you want to solve the conflicts, the, you know, the, 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 the conflicts about waste in Italy, don't give me the money. Because I think that the conflicts are part of the solution, not part of the problem. The problem when there is no conflict. When there is a conflict, we are already on the path for solution. They give me the money. So sometimes you need also not to censor yourself. The second issue is about narratives. I am an historian. I believe in the...